Hello, everybody. Um, as ever, let me know if there are sound or video problems. I see Quindy saying hello, so I'm thinking that she can at least hear me or see me. I guess maybe one or the other. Um, and she confirms. Yes, excellent. So hopefully the rest of you can as well. Uh, so what am I going to do this week? Well, I still haven't really been painting. Like I haven't painted since last week. I probably should try to start um, doing like an hour a day or an hour every other day and see how my back takes it. But it's the December's always like a crazy month. Thank you, Moon Gun Beanies, for confirming that you can hear me. Um, where I always find that I have more things to do other than painting. Um, and green users are there. Uh, so, so I haven't really gotten to that, but I have been doing more computer things. I've always been working on blog articles. So that is good. Um, so I'm going to let's switch to this view, work on this guy again. And I'm going to talk about some, uh, kind of, I, I had a very brief thought last week, the day after I finished working on it. So on Tuesday, after I finished working on while well, you all were watching, uh, and it reminded me of things that, like, issues I've had with other miniatures where it's not necessarily about the painting technique or just about the painting technique. It's about how I'm thinking about things or how I'm feeling about things. And I think that that experience is fairly common, but not a lot. Of, we don't talk about it a lot. So I think it's worth talking about and thinking about because it affects your painting. Like it affects your willingness to practice, your willingness to try new things, how you feel about your painting. Um, that all affects actually painting and what kind of results you get and how you feel about those results continues to affect those things. So um, I think it's worth talking about. I know not everyone may agree. I'll also talk about the painting, of course, as it happens. Um, Last time I used my wet palette and it's winter here and it's kind of dry. So I think I'm going to try using, if you watch Ann's show, you've seen this before. This is the famed 28 well porcelain palette. Uh, these are on Amazon now. It used to be you could only get these at Cheap Joe's. I think some of the Amazon listings say they're like imitation ceramic or some other thing. So I don't know if that means they're really like a plastic. I think one of them said melamine. I don't know. I don't know what those are like, but these are easier to clean than plastic ones. Like, you know, I've had those uh, flower well, the 10 well palettes in plastic. I've had those on the show before for doing washes and they're harder to clean because they get scratches and then the paint sticks in the scratches, you know, if you're scrubbing them off. Um, whereas the ceramic stuff, it comes off a little easier. So I sometimes have to put like, um, what's that stuff? Simple green. I put simple green or something like that on here and I have a little scrubber that um, I don't use also on my kitchen pots. It's like a kitchen pot scrubber, but I only use it for like paint type things. Um, also, so I don't, so I don't use it for cleaning either so that I don't get any substances in it just in case it would leave something behind on a palette. Um, I, I saw once and I did this to one of them and I'm not sure which one. I probably should check before I pick them up. So I'm meaning to do it again, but there's some kind of like car treatment you can put it on your car and it's supposed to help it stay cleaner and it does help these. So it's like you put it on, you just let it sit for a minute and then you wipe it off. It's like this white paste, but I do not currently remember what that's called. So I will have that off to the side and I'll show it as necessary. And then if I need to, I can throw some of this in there to slow down the drying time even more, which you can use this on a wet palette as well. But while I have something white in the frame, let me get something else white. I'm going to adjust the color a little bit. I think I need to brighten it up. So hopefully that's not too bright. bright. If that's glaring out on your screen, let me know. Because my screen is small and not the best. And then at the break, we'll talk about some stuff that Reaper's doing for the holidays. So let's see, what do I need? So uh, to review what I was doing with this miniature, I started out painting kind of a transition from this goggler green up at the top, then with olive drab kind of in the middle portion and Noel pelt at the bottom. 
of each tentacle. And in the episode where I did that, it was just near the end of the show and I did uh, um, wet blending, which takes a while to dry. So I, I had to continue with that last week. And I realized that, uh, and this is very common with wet blending, and this is a mistake people have. Um, Corporea, Aaron did this at first, where you're not going to get full coverage on wet blending the first go. So you can kind of do underpainting or you can just do multiple coats. Uh, I did multiple coats. So last week I started by um, looking at it and seeing where the paint looked patchy and fixing that up. And then I started doing some, oh, I'm leaving a step out because even in the first uh, episode when I was doing the wet blending, I decided I wanted to introduce a little bit of purple up here. So this, this one I haven't changed or done anything with, I don't think. So you can see kind of the hints of purple on this side and then this side I played around with a little more last week. And this is probably, this is like the one tentacle that I finished to complete. So there were other bits that I worked on, but this one was kind of finished to completion to test my colors and stuff. Uh, and, and I did learn some things when I was thinking about it later. And, but when I came back, uh, when I was looking at this way, after the second session, I felt like I needed some pink. And I think there is a little bit of the pink there. But so I'm using pink in the highlights here uh, and then like yellows, light yellows like that. And I think I used, I'm not even sure it was Monster Ma. I think I ended up using the darker one, but mixing it with the green, but we'll see. It would be good if I remembered. I probably should have reviewed, probably should have reviewed the tape. Uh, and I also brought out this Milani Rose, but I think it's so light that I ended up not using that at all. And I have a light purple, just in case, amethyst purple, in case I feel like that works better on the purple parts. So basically the miniature is trying to take advantage of complementary colors. So the pinks and purples up here, uh, green is the complementary color of red, which is pink, and then yellow is the complementary color of purple. Uh, so it's kind of, I'm playing around with two complementaries. It's very effective. Com they call them complementary colors because they kind of bounce off each other and accent each other. Uh, but I wanted to do them in a way that wasn't pretty because complementary doesn't mean it has to be pretty and attractive and stuff, which is the same as when I originally painted the brain part. The point was that pink doesn't have to be pretty and princess dresses and all of that kind of thing only. Um, and it's the same thing with complementary colors. So the terms make it sound like these are going to be colors that just love each other and everybody's all happy and hugging and whatnot, but that's not exactly what we're getting at with this. All right, so maybe I will just kind of do, I don't remember exactly what it is, so I'm just gonna mix up some stuff. And also it doesn't matter. What matters is if I uh, get the right values. So um, if I don't get the exact proportion of I had this yellow and that pink and whatever, it doesn't matter. It's more, am I putting things, lighter colors where there were lighter colors and then darker colors where there were darker colors. And I grabbed, there it is. So I grabbed linen white. I don't think I went light enough this time. Oh, I did have, no, I added that white too. So I have pure white too, um, but you know, pure white's really gonna dull the effect of that yellow. So I'm gonna see if I can get away just with this. And I don't know if you can see, I'm filling these up a decent amount. Uh, and if I were planning to use this palette over multiple sessions, I would fill it up even more and that's gonna help slow the evaporation. So that's why it may seem really weird. I just said my paint was drying and I've now chosen a dry palette instead of a wet palette. Um, but because of the small circumference of those little wells, you can actually sometimes keep paint better on this than on the wet palette, or the, at least the way I paint, because I mix a lot. So if you just have little drops and you mix on the brush or off on the side, you can keep stuff wet on a wet palette a long time. And then if I'm not using a session or I have to go get the phone, well, okay, we don't have to go get the phone anymore, but you know what I mean. Um, or I want to keep it until tomorrow or the next day. I get these sponges or sponges like these. I get them really wet, like so that if I just go like that, water's gonna drip out and I put it over the paint. And this will actually preserve paint better than a wet palette in my experience because it stays 
pretty close to the consistency or it gets a little drier and you add some water each day. Whereas my wet palette, sometimes I put the lid on and it's like a ter terrarium effect uh, and it gets um, wetter and it thins down the paint, which is not what I want as a well. I know Anne, uh, when she uses these, she thins the paint quite a bit in comparison. I do not. Um, I'm adding a little bit of water. I probably will add more paint actually because of that evaporation thing and he's a big guy. So why not? I don't know why that one's making a weird little suction noise. But there it is. Oh, this, I don't know if I, this is yellow mold, which I really like a lot. Um, it's like a white, but with a little bit of life in it. And even for colors that you wouldn't necessarily put yellow in, uh, it can work sometimes a little nicer, but there are also cool off-whites. I have like vampire pallor, if you have more of a blue or a green, and actually I think it works well on purple, but I haven't practiced with that lately. And I don't have them here, but uh, ghost white is a slightly blue one. Um, what is it called? Leather white, I think is what it's called, is like a warm gray one. But I like those off-whites because white can be very potent, like very powerful, it can overpower your colors easily. Um, whereas those don't, and then that helps, you know, when people feel like they're getting chalkiness, uh, sometimes it's just the, the contrast, you know, like they, they've gone up too suddenly uh, and the white looks really stark next to whatever you did underneath it. But this is clearly not enough contrast, so I need like a middle step in between those two. So I'm gonna, even though I didn't use it on the original one, let's, this pink is lighter, I think. So let's try some, put some of that in there. Go all mad scientist today. Maybe it's not light enough. It's a little lighter. Just a hint more of the yellow mold. So I'm just dipping my brush in the water and introducing a little bit of water, which I wouldn't normally do if I were mixing on a wet palette, because I think the palette paper is going to introduce a little bit of water. So I'm just kind of making up for that. So that's kind of like my lightest section. And my middle section is this all drab. Probably should be including the base colors, but I'm not. I can put them up, up there later. Um, normally I use the palette in this orientation and I kind of go from lightest to darkest and stuff. But here, since I sort of have three segments of the tentacles, it makes sense to kind of think of my mixes as three separate ones. And maybe just a hair of the pink. Use this pink. I did shake most of these before I started the stream. I don't think I shook the linen white and the white because that was like last minute. I was like, oh right, that wasn't that wasn't quite light enough. I should mess with that a little. So this part is the the annoying part of using one of these palettes. But it's like once I have this done, I can go for a long time. Now, the problem with not having my original paint out is I can't compare the values easily. So that's my original value. I think it needs to be a little lighter still. is some dried gunk off the cap of my paint. I don't want that in there. Now this, it, it, you can kind of start to feel, if you use this sort of palette frequently, you can start to feel 
the paint a little on your brush. And I think I added a little bit more water here. Um, the yellow mold, because it has more white, it feels a little thicker. Um, and I do find that when I use this, I have to add more water back into the white than when I have darker mixes. Unless I need those dark mixes to be more transparent. So you can see that mixing pink and green together gives you like a very disquieting color. So when complementary colors aren't always pretty. When I said that, I did mean it. Right here, let's try mixing. I don't want that yellow to be that bright, but we got this pink, so let's see what happens. I'll probably have to get a little bit green. Uh, sibling 2023 asked what I'm painting today. I'm painting the tentacle legs on this brain monster. Pendrake TG, do you ever use the squarish area on that palette? The only thing I use it for is if like I need just a little bit of color to do a touch up or something, I'll put it over there or do a quick mix. Or um, if I'm doing something like I've got like, a, I realize that the mold line is still there and I want to use like the sealer solution to kind of, or there's like, the surface is rough or something. I'll put it up there. In fact, that's what that is. So I should probably stop doing that because the sealer is hard to get off, but the paint will dry super quickly here. So it's either something you want to do immediately or I don't bother with that. If they made this without that, I would be perfectly happy. So unsurprisingly, that kind of made orange. So I guess we do need some green. And I think some of this more yellow. This is actually way more complicated of a mix than I normally do because um, usually when I'm introducing unusual colors, I will do that via glazes or other methods. I mean, I'm not saying I'd never do this, um, but I, especially when you're starting out mixing your own colors, if you can keep it to two, um, that will make your life easier because you don't necessarily have to remember, okay, I use three drops of this and two drops of that. If you like record little stripes of your color, do I have one of those? I don't think I have one of my note things, but I'll just use stuff like this. Uh, and I'll, so I would, if I was going to paint later, I'd be like, okay, I'll put that there. And it was, you know, this green and this yellow. And I don't need to know exactly how much I used of what. I can just mix them together. And if it seems way different than this, I can test it. You know, I, later I can come back with my paint and this would be dry. So I'd be able to compare more easily. Uh, and if something's way off, I'll be able to see it there. So mixing doesn't necessarily have to be super scary. This is not a great example because this is probably crazier mixing than uh, you would often do because I'm trying to do the weird color thing. All right, I'm just gonna put a little bit of the green in back there. I think I wanna feature the pink more heavily and I'm gonna start with this brighter runic glow, which, oh no, that's not, I thought, all right, the Milani Rose is a Pathfinder color. I thought I had another Pathfinder color, but I don't think I do in the end. And then I may also, I was adding some darkness on the sides of the tentacles to make them look um, more like cylinders. So we'll, where cylinders curve away from uh, your view. So there's a cylinder. So you can see where we're looking at it is very light. And as it curves away to either side, there's dark shadow. So that we're so used to seeing that, that you can make a flat draw, you know, you can draw a rectangle on a piece of paper. And if you have lighter there, lighter pencil, you know, you don't use the pencil there and then just the straight pencil and you go really dark on the sides, you can make, that's, that's what artists do. That's how artists make a rectangle, a flat rectangle on a piece of paper look like, um, 3d shapes, like a cylinder. And even though we're starting with 3d shapes, our things are so small that if we do stuff like that, it's going to help. the miniatures look more three-dimensional and interesting. So that's really what we're doing with when we're shading and highlighting, whether it's washes and dry brushing, or you're doing fancy layering, or you're doing wet blending or whatever thing you're doing, that is really the point of what you're doing is to create that illusion or accent, accentuate the idea that these are three, because we're not creating illusion, our things are 3D, but to accentuate the idea that we are painting 3D 
objects. All right, compare more pinks. I also feel like last week I didn't use enough texture, so I'm gonna gonna try to apply more textured brush strokes. And texture often works better with more extreme transitions than not. But here I'm also doing something a little more complicated than I usually do because I'm trying to manipulate color shifts and the complementary colors and all that stuff at the same time as doing the um, volume, how you add the the darker and lighter areas to make something look more three-dimensional. But I've done a lot of basic stuff on this show. If you're if you're new and this is your first time and the, like everything I'm doing here seems crazy, um, I've done stuff related to learning to paint kits of, of Reaper because I'm the person who wrote them. Um, and other things where I'm explaining stuff in much more detail and it's more digestible than this may be. So if this is, if this is too much, um, you know, just sit back and enjoy the, the conversation. Cause that's going to, you know, when I start talking about my thoughts after last week, that's going to apply to any level or type of mantra. And then I was using this color was the purple in the shadows on the darker one. Oh no, that's that was the lighter color shadow. The, this burgundy wine, which we discovered last week, has what they call a drying shift. So that is means that it looks different. It looks noticeably different when it's wet than when it's dry. Um, and do I have the piece of paper where we talked about that? I don't, so we'll just do it again. So I will put this down right now. And then after I finish doing this, it should be dry on the piece of paper and we can get a little wet sample. You may even be able to see it just from that, but it looks pretty, it looks kind of reddish when it's wet and more purple when it's dry. Um, I did not go back and look at the video, so it is possible that that uh, impression, because somebody was saying last week that it was very noticeable. So it's possible that it's more noticeable on video. There's a weird thing with color sometimes where some things you don't see as well on the video and other things you see more than you would see, than, than I'm seeing, like when I look at it on the video, I'm seeing more than I would see, than I do see with just my naked eye. But that, I want that one to be a little darker. So I'm gonna get my old buddy blue liner. If you have been here before, um, You've seen Blue Liner before. Sibling is enjoying the, the Zen paint mixing. I like, so I like, uh, I study traditional art a little bit. And I kind of like watching videos where people are um, doing swatches of their, their new paint colors and stuff. I find that kind of relaxing. Now this I am going to thin because the, these are going to be in the shadows. And I want it to be like a nice transition and even more Blue Liner. And we'll just put some stripe blue on right there. I want that to be nice and dark. And then the straight blue liner will be more for if I have to kind of like actually use it as liner, which I occasionally do, uh, between the tentacles. So where they are joining close to the body, I want to make sure that it's clear that each one of these is separate tentacles. And it's clear here on video because I'm holding it fairly close, but if I you know, move the, zoom the, start zooming the video out. That kind of detail is why we do, or the distance viewing is why we do stuff like lining and exaggerated contrast. Because miniatures have to look nifty, both close up and at arm's length when you're looking at them on the table or the shelf or whatever. And that's partly why miniature painting can be challenging. So it's not really that just that it's a small thing. I mean, yes, that does require a little bit of dexterity and whatnot, but it's the doing the extremes on the small thing that starts making it more challenging. So if you hear rattling, I'm using one of these. Um, I like using these little trays. I have some bigger ones too. Um, they're kind of project trays. So the paints that I'm using in this project, if I were working on something for myself or for Reaper or whatever, 
Um, I could put these aside and save them for next week if I continue painting this next week and then um, have a different project tray for something else. I mean, something like Blue Liner ends up getting put back on the shelf because I'm using on everything. But I am extra disaster today on the getting paint all over me front. So that's you. And I got paint on my little thing, but that's okay. That one is for getting paint on it. So if you're a messy painter, don't feel bad because I am too. And messy here. I mean, it's not as obvious now that I painted the tentacles, but I get messed all over the place. I'm not too worried about it. All right, I'm gonna use a slightly smaller brush than I used for the wet blending part. Because what I want to try to do is, um, you can see it a little bit here where I was trying to use like horizontal strokes or do little dots to simulate there are, there are raised areas. Let's zoom in a little. There are little raised bumps on the tops of the tentacles. So when I'm applying the paint, I'm just kind of trying to go with that texture. So last week, on Tuesday, after I walked in the room and looked at this after I'd been working on it, um, well, for one thing, I had it pointed this way, but I'm kind of getting ahead of the story. I looked at it and I was like, well, it hardly looks like I did anything at all compared to what it looked like, you know, Sunday night before I did the show. And I was a bit like, ugh, what is happening? And, that, you know, I have been doing this long enough, including, I mean, the thinking about it part. Um, sibling 2023 does something similar with a box around that size, but far less neat. I, I only had those because I was tidying up um, some drawers. I bought them to organize some things in drawers. And I bought so many, like more than I had space for in the drawers and I had them left over. And I think there was, there was some particular thing. I'm like, oh, I could put the paints in there to prep for this, whatever. And I'm like, I could put the paints in there to prep for like a lot of things. So I normally did not, I would normally just leave them on my desk, but now that I'm doing kind of multiple things, I wasn't one to paint multiple things simultaneously much, but now that I'm doing that more, um, it started becoming more and more useful to me to have a way to organize. So anyway, I was starting to get down about it. Um, and since I've had this experience before, I kind of, I kind of could take a step back and go, okay, uh, what's happening? Why, why is this happening? But it, when I, the first several years, I mean, not, I'm not saying like the first one or two, it's several years when I first started painting, kind of that emotional type thing was sometimes the hardest part. Cause it'd be like, you think you've cracked something, you think you've gotten better and improved. And then something like that happens. You're like, well, haven't I learned anything? Am I really not any better at this? I've been doing it for so long. Do I still suck this bad? That was those kind of things start going through your mind. Um, and that's a terrible way to look at that, to, to do, immediately say, okay, this is bad because I suck or because I don't know how to do this or I ha clearly haven't learned this yet. To put it all down to technique or you personally. So what is more useful is to actually say, why is this not great? And really genuinely think about that, like analyze it. Both from the point of view of, okay, why is this not as good as what I normally do? And why do I not like how this looks? So if, if I kind of started to do that right away because I'm familiar with these thoughts and issues, but, um, let's imagine that I had to think about it longer because I'm, I'm new to thinking about it that way. So the first thing I thought about was the fact that if you were here last week, um, I've, I've had a pinched nerve and last week was the first time I had painted since November 7th. So it's not like if you don't paint, you're going to forget everything, but certainly there's a practice element that the more regularly you do something, the more practiced you are at it, the more likely you are going to be able to find issues on the fly while you're painting. So it wasn't even that my hands were out of practice. Like, I don't feel like I couldn't do the same dexterity thing. I mean, the one reason I picked this is because it's a big guy and I'm not gonna have to hunch over and, and hurt my neck. Um, it was more my eye. My eye wasn't 
my eye didn't remember how much contrast I need to paint to make it look right. Um, because my eye hadn't been doing this or much of anything else so far, really, for like two or three weeks. So that's not weird. I mean, if anything, it'd be weirder if I came back after a span of time of not doing it and I was like totally amazing at it. That would be weirder, really. Um, so right there, I'm identifying some of the whys. And then I need to look at, okay, um, what don't I like about the thing? But all right, so that was one of the reasons I hadn't been doing it for a while. My eye was out of practice. Sometimes it will be your hand that's out of practice. I mean, it's not always, you know, one thing or another. It can be both. Why not both? Um, but then other things I would look at. So that would be like, okay, why did I suck? So, okay, that's why I sucked. I had a reason. It's, it's okay. And even if the reason is I was tired, um, I'm depressed because uh, my best friend moved away. Whatever thing, like your feelings do affect your work. And sometimes that's in the good, tortured artist, everything's cooler looking way. And sometimes that's in the, I'm tired and I phoned it in way. And that is okay. You're a human being. You're not a factory that's going to produce the same results every time. And expecting that from yourself is the bad thing. That's, that's what's going to make it bad. Now I'm trying to decide if I'm going too much contrast on this, the part that's darker. I'm going to get that green back, a little bit of that. Goggler green. Um, so you, you can't expect homogenous results from yourself. Like how you feel physically and mentally absolutely is going to affect what you do. And that's okay. I mean, sometimes you'll be like happy and overconfident and think that you did something better. And then the next day you come back and you're like, oh, and that's okay too. Like it just, I think it helps if you're just realistic and you understand and admit that your feelings affect it and don't like get down on yourself about that. It's like, okay, it happened. Um, I can move on and try to improve it. Cause it's also like, I'm back here. I'm doing it again. It wasn't like I had that one chance to make this guy amazing. And even if, let's say I, I had to finish it and send the pictures to Ron and it was just done. I could still fiddle on it on my own, or I could just take whatever lessons I learned and bring those over to the next miniature. Like we are really, we're way too hard on ourselves sometimes. And I think that people make themselves crazy and then your, your hobby starts not being as fun. Like if you're, every time you're going to sit down or not every time, but if frequently when you sit down, you're just going to beat yourself up about what you did. There's going to be another part of your mind is like, well, I don't like pain. So if I don't do this thing, if I don't sit down and paint, I don't have the pain of me yelling at myself. And you're like not thinking that consciously, but that's the kind of thing that'll happen unconsciously. Cause I know when I used to do that, um, when I used to get upset about things, I know I've told the story here a few times of how the first time I painted on metallic metal, I literally cried. Um, but the bad part of it, so that's fine. That I had a feeling, whatever. But the bad thing I did is I was, I wanted to avoid the pain. So I just, I put that miniature away. I didn't look at it. I didn't try non-metallic metal again for a long time. I just avoided the situation. And that is not a very useful response to that. Um, so it would have been much more effective if I had left it a couple of days, you know, let myself have my feelings. That's fine. But come back a few days later and pick that miniature up again and look at the tutorial I was following and compare what I had done to what the person in the tutorial had done and try to figure out, okay, what, what did I not do? Like, is it, is it, Am I darker here? Am I lighter there? Is the area of dark and light different than what they did? Um, what What is different between what I did and what they did? And then I could go back and try again and try to, you know, be less different than what they did and see if it worked better. That is a way healthier response to a situation like that. And that's also pretty much how you learn. That's why I'm always... I'm willing to come here and just do stuff like I won't always practice things in advance and test things I want to come here and do it on stream so that if I screw up you see that people screw up and and then 
you can fix it. And that's just how that works. So hopefully that makes sense. So I don't know if any if anyone here is willing to talk whether you've had struggles like that and you're willing to talk about it at all, um, or if everything I said seems like nonsense. I don't think that I'm like that massively more emotional than a lot of other people. I mean, I'm probably a little more emotional than other people, but I mean, some people and I'm not some other people. But I don't think my experience is that unique. I I see things in forums and on Facebook, and if I ever went on Discord, I'm sure I'd see it there too, um, that suggests a lot of people are having kind of feelings-based things. I've decided that I'm not going to worry about painting the little suckers massively differently. I'm just going to use colors I have and figure it out. I want to bring out the shapes a little bit. Because if you have been here for other sessions where I was painting this, I've been like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with the, demo. The, the suckers. And I'm like, you know what I'm going to do with the suckers? It's just not sweated that much. Uh, sibling 2023. For me, it's when I take photos. Sometimes it shows up genuine flaws, but other times it's like, why does this look so bad? Yeah, photos can be helpful. Um, but photos of anything are actually not exact representations of life. We're just used to thinking of photos that way, but photos tend to make... Uh, you know, natural shadows, like if, if you took a photo where my hand is over the paper, uh, but let's do, let's do the brush maybe, that'll, no, see the problem is that I've got the camera exactly down, uh, but if you imagine like your, your hand is casting a shadow on your, you know, you've got it next to your face and it's casting a shadow, uh, it will often look darker in a photo than it really does in real life, or it'll look, um, less colorful like there's often a lot of more colors in shadows than it seems uh photos in general depending on what you're using the color can change a lot because they're all i mean it's programming so somebody made a program that decides what the color does and then when you take pictures of very small things it seems like sometimes that messes with the camera's brain and it shifts the color even more it helps if you use a background like this um, something that's light gray or light tan or light blue. Light gray is the best if you can get it. Um, because your camera's set up to think X amount of the, the picture plane is going to be, uh, like 20% or 30%, um, value darkness, like on a value scale. So... Taking pictures of things on a black background, black background is much more challenging than taking pictures of them on a light background. I mean, you can do it, but it can require more photo know-how and playing around and stuff. Moving your lights around is also often very um, helpful to changing your photo experience. You actually want lights, I like brighter lights further away, or if you have dimmer lights closer to it you might need to diffuse the lights a little bit um, but certainly it's I mean you will see you will see stuff that you don't see with the naked eye and sometimes you don't need to fix that stuff because you don't see it with the naked eye um, I need to fix that stuff because the photo is really more what I'm selling than the miniature most of the time um, but certainly if you're just using your cell phone. Absolutely, there are going to be there are going to be time, and cell phones can take pretty amazing pictures. Now, I'm not actually dissing cell phone photos. Like right now, um, I would I would I tell people, you know, if you are not doing this, like you're not selling your miniatures where you, or the photos of them where you need to have really nice photos, you do not need to go buy a fancy camera. If you have a fairly new generation uh, cell phone, you can take pretty good pictures of your miniatures, mess around with the lights, mess around with the background, all that kind of stuff. Even if you have a good camera, you still have to do those things. That's like the worst part of getting a new camera is you have to go back and figure all of that out again because the new camera's programmed differently than the old camera was. So it's like the second camera I had for taking pictures of miniatures, the first camera I had was just like a one megapixel digital camera. It was like they had just invented Digital cameras, not like just invented because I wasn't rich, but it was like just a little cheapy digital camera. Um, 
and it couldn't really take pictures of miniatures. So once I started doing this more, I got a better camera. And that one, it would punch reds. I mean, it would punch reds hard. So everything I painted red, sometimes it looked better because, you know, it was more vivid or whatever. But it was definitely not like what I did. Like I would have to go in and either just note, like if I was just taking the picture or to assess where I was with something, just know that the red was not right. Or if I was trying to take a picture that accurately represented the object, um, I would have to, you know, dial back the red saturation. And then the next camera I got, it, it almost did the opposite. It was like, it didn't saturate reds enough. So then I had to like kind of adjust again. And that was like after I had already adjusted the light stuff and the distance of the lights and where the lights are. Like all of those things can make a huge difference to picture taking. So I end, I'm not using some of those mixes that I, I mixed very much. And that absolutely happens when I'm painting. When I, if I do stuff like that, where I haven't tested all my colors out in advance, which I very often do not, I will find that, you know, this mix is too light or this mix is too dark or whatever. And I either adjust the mix or I just, you know, mi now I know when I mix what I need and I just ignore that little section. And now I feel like I need some of that medium green back. So I'm trying out a little more texture in last time and I'm accepting that that means it may look kind of yuck. Cause I can go over that with the glaze. I can soften that down really easily. Um, but the hard part is getting onto my brain and not resisting that impulse that makes me say, I, it's too much, I have to fix it now. It's gonna, I'm gonna let it sit on the shelf. Like I know I can see that this looks a little rough on screen but I need to look at it again in person and then think about what to do. So I might like address some of that now and I might not. I might just, you know, wait, wait and see. Cause viewing mode, your brain is kind of in a different place when you're looking at something, just looking, or if you're looking at something and painting it. And you make a lot of bad decisions if you only look at something closely when you're painting it. You are never going to be able to look at your stuff with the same dispassionate uh, eyes as a, a viewer who is not you. But you can you can get closer. Photographs are one way. Um, another thing you can do is grab your mini and hold it up to a mirror because it flips it. You can flip a photograph too, and that can be helpful. But it's like it forces your brain to see it in a new way. So it's, it's not exactly like it's a brand new thing you've never seen before, but it's at least a little bit of a shift and sometimes you can see stuff. This works with drawings too, if you're doing digital drawings, or I guess if you're doing physical drawings, you can take a picture and then flip it. Uh, you will find a lot of places where like, oh, the proportions are way off on that, or this isn't symmetrical and it should be, or whatever, if you flip it. Uh, my cat just barged open the door. I don't think there's, I think my husband's got his doors closed, so hopefully you will not hear any boring meetings. But if there starts to be a boring meeting, I will uh, jump up and close that door. Because I know you guys have heard him sometimes in the past. Hey, Valander. Uh, sibling also said um, that, that they found the, the conversation about how I was having feelings and how sometimes it's good to assess things more on a critical level instead of a just a gut reaction of I am terrible level um which one see this is the problem with things like tentacles it's like which one was I working on? ah it's down here um they found that discussion helpful so if you came in a bit later I was discussing how when after last week when I first went back and looked at this miniature I was kind of like holy crap why is this so terrible um and that there are more, there are healthier and more productive ways to have that discussion than just I suck and everything is terrible. I suck and everything is terrible is not gonna improve your miniature painting and it's gonna make you paint less, as sibling said. I think the brain tricking you into avoiding paint is something that I can relate to. Yeah, so if you, if you focus on the parts of 
you know, your results and how everything makes you feel terrible, it's pretty easy to stop. Like, this is all subconscious and stuff, but you're going to stop wanting to paint or do whatever other thing as a hobby if every time you do it, all you think about is how terrible you are. Like, like we don't want to, we don't want to feel crappy all the time, weirdly enough. So, um, we can do that to ourselves. Like, we always think about it being other people making us feel terrible about things, but we can make ourselves feel pretty terrible about things. So you kind of got to separate the, this was my result and I hate it. So then I hate me from the, this is my result and I hate it. So what could I do differently? What could I change or improve? Like there's, there's definitely a healthier and a less healthy way to approach that kind of thing. And I feel like I had another point that I'm now forgetting. I don't know if it's coming to me. So that was that tentacle. I'll do this one now. And now you can probably hear a very sad cat. And that is Corbin the overdramatic. He was trying to get my husband to do something. I don't know what. Probably snacks, but it could be going outside. But whatever problem Cormac is having is like the worst problem in the world. And he's going to tell you all about it. Oh, I think that's what I was going to say. So it is very useful to figure out what you like about miniature painting other than having pretty miniatures at the end. Because the end is far away. Like you sit down and you're painting a miniature. There's, there's a long time between the I'm going to paint this and the here's this lovely painted miniature. Even if you're just speed painting, there's still, you know, you got to prep it. Um, maybe you're batch painting, so you're not going to finish that one right away. There's time. There's time in between the impulse and the having the finished thing. So the finished thing can't be your only motivation. It can't be the only thing that you get out of doing this because it's not enough. It's not enough to sustain your interest, uh, especially through, you know, troubles like that. But if you identify things you like about the process, even if you have a bad painting session, you can still have fun. You can say, okay, well, this miniature didn't turn out great. Maybe I didn't even learn anything, but I got to sit and do something peaceful and relaxing and listen to an audio book or, you know, watch stuff on Twitch or whatever. Um, I got something out of it. The thing you get out of it doesn't have to be an amazing miniature. It doesn't have to be an award that you win. Um, it doesn't have to be winning, winning the game that you're painting the miniature for. The, it, the more you figure out what you like about this part, the happier you are. And I didn't learn that with miniature painting. I did that, when I learned miniature painting, I did it the exact wrong way and I was way too invested in my results. Uh, then, you know, well, well, it's probably going on seven years now. Uh, I, I went to, I started learning traditional art and I was kind of going through the same thing where I would do something and I would hate it and I would be frustrated. And then I'm like, okay, no, I, I really, I don't want to do this again. Is there a better way? And, and that was kind of, and I'm, you know, this was not like a one day revelation. And then the next day, everything was fine. This took place over a period of time, but that was the secret was figuring out that, okay, even if I draw a terrible, terrible picture that I just never want to look at again, if I sat there and got, you know, got in the zone, I like that. If I like just seeing color do stuff. I like the transformation. So that's, that's a big thing that I like in miniature painting. It goes from like, you know, gray or whatever, black, whatever color primer or prep or whatever you use to having color. And then it goes from color to having depth or, or shifts in color. I, I like watching that happen. The, the transformation from, you know, one thing to another. That is something I really like in miniature painting. And that's the process. That's not, you know, the end result is just the thing. It's not changing anymore. It's done. 
So I can only enjoy that during the process. And knowing that, um, having things that I enjoy about the process instead of focusing on the, here's my result, and whether this was worth doing or not all rests on what I think of my result. That makes it a lot easier to try and do the thing. If it's not all about. It's about the activity as well as the, the tangible product at the end. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, let's do more pinky here. These suckers are a little more obvious than some of the other suckers. I'm sure there is a more correct name for the suckers that I do not know offhand. Well, I don't know if I showed the um, color shift again when the paper dried. So let's get that paper back. So this is the dried um, burgundy wine. And I'm pretty sure this is unadulterated on my palette. This is what it looks like wet. So I don't know how dramatic, the, the difference might be more dramatic than it is and it might be less dramatic than it is on video because that happens sometimes. Um, let's see. Pendrake, I kind of need to feel up for it positive in order to paint. So I never really had to combat the negative when painting. Um, if you find some positive stuff in the activity, it can sometimes turn into something that you do when you feel bad. So it's like, I feel bad, I'm gonna go paint because then I'm gonna get out of my head. I'm gonna stop thinking about whatever thing is that's making me feel bad. I'm gonna do this thing that I enjoy doing and it will push me away from stupid thoughts. Uh, Pendrake, uh, Ella Break. No, that was actually Corbin, who is the orange tabby, was asking my husband. Oh, it, it's just about food time. So they get wet food at like 10 a.m., 4 p.m., and then 10 p.m., uh, which is somewhat of a holdover from our very old cat that we had to feed like every 10 minutes because he would eat like two bites and then stop. But um, I think it, you know, in nature, apparently, like a mouse is about 30 calories, which is just weird to think about. So they hunt, you know, it's kind of the opposite of snakes. They hunt small things often or eat small things often um, rather than having big meals occasionally. Is more natural for cats. And since we are able to, you know, feed them that way, we go ahead and do it. I mean, they also get crunchies, which apparently is not super healthy. I mean, like crunchies are out all the time because I always, I always just kind of feel like I don't like when people tell me when I should eat. So I, if I was my cat, I wouldn't want it. But apparently it is healthier if you kind of have more specific meals. So then it encourages them to eat more at the meals and eat more healthy food instead of bugging you for treats all the time. But that is not how the cats were brought up. So that's not what we're doing. I feel like if we if we change that, Ella would just be like, I, she's not she's not great with change. She's not great at grasping things, and she'd be like, I don't understand what's happening, but I hate it. And then she'd probably just yell at us until we changed it. She's not, um, she's not like totally a cat that like pesters you about stuff. But when she does care about something, yeah, she does not let that go. So we're just lucky she doesn't care about very many things. It's like snuggles and food on time. And not changing things too much, <laughs> I guess. It's like she remembers people she met when she was three months old, but anyone she's met after that is like, nope, I have, you, you don't need to be in my life. Goodbye. So like even people that she's known since she was six months old, when they come over and take care of her, she's like, mm, nope, you don't really need to be here. I want my real people back. It's like, well, those are the people you get, so why don't you go ahead and let them pet you?
So there, I didn't get the, I, that's a mold line. Or I didn't get the paint um, as smooth as I would like, but that's the nice thing about textured brush strokes. Maybe we can kind of disguise some of that. Make people not see it as much. Pro Painter Secret, sometimes if you see tattoos, that's places where we didn't get the blends as good as we want them. I have only had to do that occasionally, but I can see, and I think you can see it on camera too, there's a place where there is no paint on this tentacle back there, this one back here. So, and that should be my lighter color. Green. Yeah, the Noel Pelt. And then how will I get it there? Good question. This might be this might be a job for hook brush. So you know you get that little hook on the end of your synthetic brushes sometimes, and this one doesn't actually have that much. Um, that can actually be very handy for like getting under the cloak edges or other places where you can't quite reach. And I feel like this might be one of those places. That's what I was trying to avoid. But if I get there quick, I should be able to rub it off. And if I don't get there quick, I can paint over it. Because that's the other reason it doesn't make sense to be there. So this is acrylic paint. It paints over itself. You can just fix it if you don't like it. And you don't have to. I think uh, learning from something and moving on to the next project is a completely appropriate response. But if you do feel like you, you want that thing to be better, you can just paint it over. Especially adding shading and adding more shading and highlighting is not quite as terrible as I thought it was when, when I first started painting. Because I was afraid of mixing paint. Like all that crazy stuff you saw me do. I would not have done that when I first started painting. Not even a little. Um, but the adding more highlighting and shading is not as challenging as doing straight up color mixing. You might put something down, like here, we'll, we'll mess one up and show you what I would do. So I'm gonna go way too light here. So theoretically, I should see that as the brush is getting closer, but I can just wipe it off. You can scrub it off. You can do a little test stroke, just be prepared to get it off quick. Um, it rubs off better with a synthetic brush, or I can paint over it with the, um, what was the middle green? Olive drab. Once it's dry, which is not, but to put a little bit there. Uh, and it can go the other way. Let me find one that's too dark. And that one can be harder to see on your brush because your brush is kind of dark. Like, is that right? And I put it down and like, oh, nope, it's not right. So you, you can do, like, you can test on the figure and it's not going to be the end of the world. And the more you do it, the better you become at matching values where you make fewer mistakes. Which is not to say I, I never make any mistakes, but um, matching value and color is tough. Well, tougher than um, doing it in black and white or grayscale. Although certainly if you were here when I was, was it actually on Halloween? Now I can't remember. But I painted something like around Halloween and I, I did a vampire in just you know, black, white, and shades of gray. And there were a couple times when I got the color wrong. The value, I should say. There is no color, there's just value when you're painting those. And so I just fixed it. I'm not sure why I keep holding this down low instead of actually like closer to my face because that will be nicer on my back and my eyes. And I think doing that kind of um, thing improves your painting generally. So like grab an old miniature uh, that you didn't paint with enough contrast 
or you know something you do tabletop real quick and adjust it and that is actually a pretty good exercise see there I totally did too dark of a light I can in this case I'm just gonna add a bit of water I'm thinning that paint down which makes it more transparent and thus less dark and then over here I probably do want that I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna wet the edge. I'll blend it in a little bit. Monsters are especially nice to start practicing stuff like that because if you mess up, I mean, it's not really that noticeable. You know, monsters are supposed to look messed up, right? I need a little more. Make it a little pinker. I think I almost want my brighter pink, which I did not put out separately. The runic glow. Oh, hello, Raiders. We've got melan melancholy. I'm very bad at, at names. Um, and 43 Raiders, welcome. Today I'm working on the, do I know what this is? No. Uh, I'm sure it's not called Brain Monsters, which is what I call it in my head. Maybe Quindy can find this for us in the store. Um, but I painted the brain part a while back and I thought and thought and thought about how to paint the tentacles and finally had an idea. So I painted them green, but they have notes of pink and purple to tie them in with the brain part. I did the initial um, color application with wet blending and now I'm adding a bit more color and a bit of texture and you know shades and highlights basically to make things more three-dimensional and bring out shapes and textures and whatnot. But I'm and let, I will show my palette again. So I'm using because let's see where where I am with this whole. It's not going to dry as fast. So I'm not having the same kind of problems I had last week, where I had big pools of paint on my wet palette and it was drying too fast for me to do anything. Absolutely, it's dried a little, and I'm wishing that I had made more of this one because I do seem to be using a lot of that. So let's see if I can mix some more of that. And this absolutely happens when I'm using this um, setup to paint other things. I will have that problem where there's just one, one or two pools that I end up for whatever reason for the blending process. I'm using way more of that than um, something else. And I have to make more. That is not weird at all. So go ahead and use my dropper bottle in this case. Or my water. And I think it's a little more green that was. So let's put in some more purple. And I can't remember. I don't think I put any of the yellow in here. I think it was just the greens and the purple, or the greens and the pinks. Making creepy colors with green and pink. Darth Abacus, ask Reaper anything. Oh, this is new, Quindy. What's that? Uh, what is this feature that Darth Abacus is telling us about? So if you're watching later on YouTube, it's a link that's available to people in the Twitch uh, chat, which I guess is a reason to come hang out on Reaper Twitch chats. Quindy has also found a link to the monster, which is officially called the Hive Warden. So that is good to know. But yeah, I think you can see that the paint's still in pretty good shape. I might need to add water to some of them. The ones with white, the ones with white where there's a lot of white in the paint, which is like that one and that one. Um, they seem to dry out a little quicker or evaporate. The water evaporates out a little quicker. And they're also more opaque, like the green and the yellow 
are not super, you know, they're not as opaque colors. The, the, a lot of the pinks that I've chosen have white in them, so they're decently opaque. Yeah, that's what I figured. And if I just start stirring it, I can kind of see whether it's too thick or not. Let's yeah. zoom a little. So to me, uh, generally speaking, I like paint pretty close to the consistency it comes out of the bottle from the Reaper factories. Like new, new Reaper paint is about the consistency I paint most things with. There are, you know, types of, like if I'm doing glazes, I'm thinning that way down. If I'm doing washes, I'm thinning it down. Um, and then stuff like the, okay, if it's white and it's too, you know, it's got a lot of white in it, it's too stark. I'm thinning that down. But for, for those who watch Anne in the morning, so if you, if you like more videos of people painting, you wanna watch Anne on this channel, at I want to say 11:30 central when Quindy will correct us in chat. Um, I actually do not do the bulk of my painting with this, but it's going to sound contradictory. When I want paint to last longer, or I want to keep it over several days to be able to use it again and again, uh, when I'm working on blending like a big cloak or something, because um, I my thing is kind of doing is super smooth blending. I use this, which seems counterintuitive to using a wet palette. I use a wet palette for you know single sessions. Uh, sometimes I can get a little bit out of the paint the next time, but it would just be like doing repairs and stuff. I wouldn't be trying to do like extensive painting with paint that I'd left on a wet palette overnight. It might be wetter than it was when I started. It might be drier than it was when I started. The way I use a wet palette, um, I'm still mixing like that. Like I'd have still mixed all of these colors on the wet palette, so they wouldn't be just little drops. They'd be big pools. And as soon as you have big pools on a wet palette, um, it starts evaporating a lot quicker. So when I was doing that, I was using these same kind of colors last week uh, and because it's winter where I am and the forced air heater is going, the paint dried out, you know, my stream is two hours and the paint dried out before. Like it, I was just having so many problems at the last half hour or so I couldn't really even do what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought, well, this time I'll use this palette. But when I was saying I keep it over from session to session, I don't keep it like this. I get these super wet sponges and I put them on top. So I, I call it reverse wet palette because the wet is coming from the top. And I have successfully kept paint a week or more that way. Um, you will occasionally have to add some water to the um, little pools. And then if it's super dry where you are, because this was kind of funny. I live in the, in the Southeast, which is not like the dry part of America. Uh, you can add, where did I put it? So if you're having a lot of problems with paint drying out on either surface, you can add a little bit, like you just want to add a little bit and then a little bit more if, later if you need it, of this stuff called drying retarder. So Reaper sells this, but you get, if you can get this like similar things from art store brands and stuff if you don't have easy access to Reaper paints where you live. And there are even some paints that they mix a little bit of that in when they make the paint. So if you found that you have paints where it seems like, oh, this one dries way slower than this other one, it probably has some of that stuff in it. And for some people that's a feature and for some people that's a bug. Everybody likes different things, but if you, if also if you've tried to wet blend and you've had trouble, just because you you really have to be fast, a little bit when you're wet blending, uh, especially when you're starting out and you're just figuring it out, you can add that stuff to your paint like a little bit, because you want fair you don't actually want super watered down paint when you wet blend. That is harder to wet blend with because it dries so much faster. I'm not gonna go nuts on these tentacles. Really, really you're not seeing those too much unless you're going right out, so. When I'm painting something that I'm really fussing about, I will absolutely um, paint parts that you're not gonna see unless you tip it over. I mean, honestly, as a contest judge, we do occasionally look at things at weird angles. Uh, we care most whether it looks correct at the angle you're supposed to view it at, but, you know, everything should be painted, so. We may occasionally check if things weren't painted or there's some other kind of 
I mean, it seems odd, but we, I mean, it's, it's where, but we do, you know, when, when you're at ReaperCon, you, you'll put something down on the table and no one other than you and the contest judges is, a, or contest staff, because the people who work there um, can move stuff around too. Uh, but, so it should just stay whichever angle you put it at. But when we're judging, we pick it up and we go like this 100%. Which is why you should always make sure that they're attached to the base. You, you might think, of course, you would attach it to the base. But not everybody does. Because sometimes you want to look at it later. Or you, you leave a note and you tell us this figure is not firmly attached to the base. And then we know. And we're careful. Um... Melancholy. I didn't know that was a thing for water-based paints. Yes. So it's called, I think it's almost always called drawing retarder. Uh, yeah, I, there's some, there's some things that, you know, different companies will call it different things, but I think that one is almost always called, uh, drawing retarder. How long have I been painting? Do I mainly do miniatures or other things as well? I've been painting miniatures for 18 and a half, 19 years, something like that now. Um, Honestly, I should be better at it than I am now. Because I, I paint, the whole time I've been painting very seriously. I didn't really um, pick miniature painting up to paint stuff for games. I mean, I liked the idea that we could use them in games. But from the beginning, I was sort of attracted to the whole going into contests and stuff like that. Um, and then about seven years ago, I mean, I did, I took art class like in high school. But about seven years ago, I started being interested in studying um, traditional art drawing painting um, I've done a little bit of oil painting I haven't done it on miniatures I've only done it on canvas I'm certainly intrigued that seems to be the hot new thing or hot new the current hot thing I mean it's not like people weren't using oils to paint miniatures long ago and then people who paint stuff like tanks and things like that they'll use oils to do um, I think they call them pin washes because you're trying to bring up um, the little rivets or something. I don't know. I did look this up and now I can't remember the answer. Um, so it's not that people using oil paint on miniatures is a brand new thing. People painting busts and tanks and stuff like that have been doing it for a long time. But it really was not very common, if at all, in on the gaming side of miniature painting. And now it's kind of really become a hot thing. Because then, then you have, like, the opposite problem. Then it's not, like, things dry too fast. Then your problem is that things dry too slow. And I haven't tried that yet. I, I think about it because I have oil paint. And in particular, I would probably want to try um, the water-soluble oils. Um, Water-miscable. So you could clean it up with water. You're, you're not really meant to use water as the solvent as much as like in the same way that we would in miniature painting or acrylic painting. Uh, I haven't painted, it's, it's interesting, so the acrylic painting I pretty much only do on miniatures. Um, I haven't really done acrylic painting on canvas or paper or whatever. And I don't know if that's because, you know, okay, like I've already worked a bunch with acrylics or just, I don't know why. I, I mean to, and then I don't, but. Okay, these tentacles are messing with my sense of orderly progression because I have to follow the tentacle instead of just painting from left to right or whatever. I would normally do. But then when I started studying, um, more traditional art, I kind of have a art ADD. Well, I have regular ADD too. But um, it turns out, little did I know, only very recently diagnosed. Um, but I liked all of the things. So I have like um, pastels. And dry, well, I don't have dry pastels. I don't want to get interested in dry pastels. Um, they're, I mean, apart from being super expensive, which, I mean, a lot of art supplies are, but there's particulate... Uh, there's particulates involved, like it's it's dry pastels. That's why they call them dry pastels. And if you if you've attended here before, you've heard me have coughing fits, and I figure I don't need to I don't need to do anything that's gonna 
aggravate the passages or whatever. I live somewhere where there's more than enough particulates in the air because we live in a valley and there are four million trees here. There may be four million trees just in my yard. I don't know. It's funny when I hang out with uh, some of the painters from then they're from like Texas or California and they're always like, we gotta plant more trees. And I was like, okay, I literally don't know how much tree, how many trees are in my yard. I think I'm doing my part. I'm cool. That's a long time. Um, and, and then there, I bet there are people on this channel right now in the chat. If you're listening, chat people, how long have you been painting? Cause I bet there are plenty of people who can beat 18 years that I am just a baby painter to some folks. But one of the things I talk about is how there's a lot of, doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, but some of the, some of the struggles we have are all the same kind of struggles. And there's always something to learn, is what I think. And that, that was actually one of the best benefits of starting to learn um, traditional art, is I had kind of, I, I had kind of stalled in my miniature painting. Uh, and I knew I wasn't like perfect, or I didn't think I was perfect. I just didn't know what to work on. Like that, the stall was, I don't know where to go from here. Um, and, Studying traditional art was very helpful because it, it talked about some things that we don't, I mean, people talk about it more now, stuff like the volume and things like that. Uh, but it just kind of gave me a different view on some stuff and then it reignited my interest in miniature painting as well. So that was nice. Because I was, I was sad that I wasn't excited about miniature painting but I just just stalled out because part of the fun for me is learning like for some if, if you just kind of want to okay I've got the basic techniques down I just want to sit uh when I get home from work and paint and not think about things too much that is 100% valid like this earlier I was talking about you got to figure out what you like about the process and that helps keeping keep you coming to the table where where you're excited about the activity as well as the thing that you make at the end um so for me, learning and solving problems and stuff is one of the things I get excited about of the process. I don't expect that that's everyone um, at all, uh, but that that's why I kind of like it. Uh, so Moon Glum Minis has had two painting phases, currently from around 2004 or so, so about the same time I started. Uh, but before that, painted from 80 to 86. And if I recall correctly, really loves the classic figures. Quindy has been painting for eight years or so. So even more baby painter. Uh, and Melancholy started making clay sculptures only around two years ago and started painting them around the same time. Oh, so you do like polymer clay sculpture? There are several artists that I follow who do that on um, Instagram and I love it. And the one guy... Oh, can I remember his name? No, because it's kind of Russian. Um, he does, like the, he, the way he paints them is really fantastic too. Um, and I finally was able to buy one of his because he does a lot of dragons and I'm kind of super into dragons. I have a little collection. Uh, so I now have one of his dragons. I'm very happy about that. It's all like teal and stuff. So it's colors I love too. But I'm hoping to buy more in the future. Um, but yeah, no, I think the, the polymer clay stuff is super cool and, and they, they paint a little bit differently than, than people do in miniature painting, but there's some super amazing painting and on it, like depending on the size of your sculptures, um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in, in miniature painting is still going to be relevant to what you want to do, but you probably don't have to worry quite as much about like this shading and the volumes and all that kind of stuff I'm talking about. The, the larger miniatures people paint, um, the more that becomes like a different issue as well. So the gaming scale figures are typically 
30 to 40 miniature, 30 to 40 millimeters tall. And 40 is kind of the far end. That would be like with a hat or something. Um, the ones Moongum likes to paint are more like 25 millimeters tall. But now people paint ones that are 75 or 120 millimeters tall, or they paint busts where it's like one twelfth or one tenth the size of a normal human head. And those, you still need to do some of that stuff that I'm talking about here, um, but less of it. And But then you have to do more like the color thing that I'm doing. If you're painting like a face or something, like skin, or something else that has a lot more natural variation. You've got to add more of that in. Some of that you can't even do, even if you want to, on the smaller scale miniatures. I mean, you can add in a little more of that than you might think when you start painting. But it kind of tops out that, that at a certain point, you're making noise, not interest. And this guy is actually larger than one. typically do just the person figures but it's nice for the stream if when meant to do bigger stuff now and then because it's this camera is not like the best I really 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 I picked out the camera I wanted everything and it is expensive and the Black Friday sales laughed at me and said no you can't have that it's too new so I'm still still just dreaming about my video camera that I wish I had. It should do, uh, it's, it's actually this, like the, just the current generation of the still camera I have, which I really like. Um, but the one I have, I think it can only, it can't make a video longer than 20 minutes. Like I think that it just stops, um, as a protection from heat, I believe. Um, and it's old enough that I don't know what the quality would be. I've thought about testing it just to kind of see if I could at least do a short. It, like I'd have to record, I couldn't use it for live, obviously if it's gonna crap out after 20 minutes, but I might be able to use it for, you know, something for my YouTube or Patreon or something. Add a little shading under here because this, you know, it's curling down here. And then also it contrasts with the tentacle parts a bit or the suckers. That none of you, I, whoever knows the correct term for the suckers, is just choosing to instead laugh at my incorrect terminology, which is perfectly valid. Do you uh, use regular uh, acrylics on your painting, Mergendell? Oh, I think you're pausing to have dinner. Um, oh, thank you. But yeah, as far as I know, a lot of the polymer people uh, use regular acrylics of one form or another. I think these fluid ones probably are good for 3D things of whatever size because you're not adding unwanted texture or removing texture that you worked on. Certainly that's important with these miniatures. This guy isn't a super fine detail one, but you, you could clog up some of the these little things up here if you really worked at it. Oh, I'm on the wrong tentacle. I need to focus. I need to focus on one tentacle at a time. 
One tentacle at a time. That's how to take life. Hopefully he's staying in focus. I haven't been checking enough. Some of these suckers are big enough that they need a little more specific treatment. I'm kind of back to the back to the wet blending just because of impatience. But I need to check the time and see. I think my back says it's time for the break, but let's let me just finish. I think that finishes that tentacle. We're close enough. All right, let's see what time. Yes, let's let's pause momentarily, and I will put my sponge over this. And now I wish I'd made an extra sponge. Oh well. And let's talk about what Reaper's doing for the holidays. Oh, I hope, I hope work goes okay for you, sibling. Thanks for coming in and joining us. All right, so I'm not going to show you any Christmas miniatures in person this year. Um, you know what? My phone works better, doesn't it? Because I didn't paint any. Because of all the neck problems and whatnot. But all right, let me... So this is the... Right, there's a software update in case you were wondering. Turn that off. I think it works better. This is the 12 Days of Reaper graphic. So these are the figures that are available. And unlike some years, it's just any of these. You get to pick which one of these you want if you make an order of $40 or more on the Reaper store. And I believe this is not available to um, Australia, the Asia Pacific area, because the uh, distributor there does not do the things. And I know that that is super annoying and feel free to be better about that in chat if you want. Um, it is available in England. I think you're getting metal instead of uh, bones USA though. But I've painted many of these, so I thought I would go through them. Oh, this guy actually isn't in the 12 Days of Reaper. Uh, he's in, if you go on the Reaper site, there's a stocking stuffer banner where there's, uh, some of the, the, the holiday looking miniatures. So like this guy and there's Christmas Eve and Christmas night that Jessica Rich painted and a bunch of other cool ones. But there's also some non-miniature things. Um, the, anyway, there's some non-miniature things, the, the mini handles, the, I think there's the pallets, the carrying case, some other stuff like that. But the holiday figures are only available at this time of year. So they open up sales for them in every December and then they go back in the vault the rest of the year. Uh, so this is Nick, the Christmas Rogue, I think is his name. And there's the back. And I've done a previous episode, I think last year, I did painting red, but it was on a pretty small figure. Uh, and I just kind of showed you how I do it. I was thinking maybe I'd do an episode where I explore different methods and why I do what I do with the uh, salmon highlights. This is the guy I think I painted. So I painted this last year for Ron and then I took the same figure and just did the red clothes on stream. And have I finished him? No, I have not. But I would like to because my parents uh, really fell in love with this guy. So I want to finish him up and send him to my parents. Um, so this is Mistletoe Goblin, and he's got a little box of chocolates. And I believe Julie, who may still be in chat, sculpted this. That is a good point. Who sculpted this? Pretty sure it was Bobby Jackson. If Julie sculpted it, she will yell at me, or Bob. She will yell at me that I got that wrong. But this uh, goblin, I'm pretty sure it was Julie. And there it is from the back, and he's just so adorable. You just want to give him a hug. And that is from the the kissable side view. Julie is confirming that she sculpted this guy. And then she also sculpted this one, which is, I think it's called Christmas Hugs in the in the graphic, or when you wish to choose it from the uh, 
options if you make an order. Uh, and I love pink. It's just, just, the, just the glee in the dragon's face. But also, so all of the, this was a little, when I first sat down, I'm like, oh, that's a lot. Like you, um, oh, that's the weird sticker thing that, thank you. Thank you, Apple. Um, that it does now. So when it was just primed, it was a little hard to work out what some of those were. So if you have trouble with what, what are all the awesome presents on the base, uh, if you go to my website up there, um, search for Christmas, you'll get to it eventually. But I've done a diagram where I circle each of the different items and explain what they are to help you figure them out. But it's definitely gamer stuff because there's dice and paints and rule books and there are, oh, there's the brushes. There's some brushes there. But also awesome toys. And a bit of candy. There's some candy canes. And this one, do I remember the name of this one? I don't. Cat, dragon, and tree? I don't know. Julie also did this because Julie knows cats. And I had to paint it like Corbin. Even though, so when we got Corbin, he's a very... He needs some entertainment. He, he's a little mischievous, I guess. And that, that next year, you know, first year we put up the Christmas tree, we were like, okay, this is going to be a disaster. Like, he's going to be all up on that tree and knocking everything down. So we fully expected this scene, and it did not actually happen. Once we finished hanging up the decorations, like, he was very interested in the hanging up process because everything was moving and jiggling and shiny. But once it was up, he didn't care. Like, he's, he's a very good hunter, and he really only cares if it's actual prey or pretty good simulation of prey. Like if we have a feather on a string and we kind of jerk it around like it might be a real animal. Um, so he did not do this. I, my, our other cat, Ella doesn't do it anymore, but she used to climb up about halfway the tree and then just sit there. So she didn't really wreck anything. She just like being halfway up a tree. Um, but now she just sits under the tree. But this was like a Corbin thing to do. So I still used him as my painting inspiration. If I do paint this year's, uh, there's a, a new cat dragon who's stealing some cookies. Um, I, I would paint that as Archer, who is our cat that's no longer with us, because there really was a, a holiday cookie incident with Archer where we took the cookies away from him. Like he, we, we had people over, there was like a side table with some food on it. Um, and there were, it was a plate of Christmas cookies up there and he got up there and we didn't notice. And then someone looks over and he's like licking the Christmas cookies. So we, separated those cookies away from the rest and you know put them down and he was like mad about that Archer had kind of like a temperament issue so he was really sweet except when he wasn't and then he was like the literal exact opposite so he's just like growling and yowling and yelling and then my husband is like okay fine let's give him the cookies back and he was like so mad he just slammed the bowl with the little cookies in it and they were covered in powdered sugar and just powdered sugars everywhere. Like it was so bad we had to go get a vacuum, which normally, you know, someone drops something on the floor at a party. You're like, whatever, I'll deal with it later. But this was just like powdered sugar everywhere. Because he was like so mad. He's like, I don't even want your stupid cookies now. It was pretty hilarious. That's so you can see a bit more how Julie sculpted the wings. This is also by Julie. And this is a very mischievous in my head this this guy isn't messing with his own stocking he's got somebody else's stocking and he's grabbing some candy canes out of it and then you can't see in the one of the reasons i wanted to show these is because you know ron only shows them from one angle and you can't see the all the cool scales and stuff that julie sculpted on the back and well now i'm gonna hold on let me go back so yeah, I, I mentioned that I, I did a stream about this and it'll be on the Reaper channel. There's a Beyond the Kit um, playlist. So there's the stream about painting red, but there's also an article on my website up there for that one. There's not an article for that because that's from longer ago than I was writing the articles. There's the article for this, which talks about how to paint this. Well, there may be two articles, but there's at least one that talks about painting the gold non-metallic metal as well as... Um, a guide, a guide map to all of the, um, what the gifts are. There's not an article about painting this guy specifically, but there are two articles about painting, um, for patterns like that. So I didn't, I didn't, just didn't have anything additional to say on that topic since I've written like two articles on it already. Um, with the little stripes, like how you get that to look a little more natural and stuff like that. 
there is an article on painting this guy, which is more about underpainting because I did, you know, the where, where the shading and highlighting is. I worked that out with uh, black and white primer before I put the paint on. And then I kind of roughed it in with colors before I made it look nice. <coughs> you can see there's some candy canes and some other gifts in there. Juan and I usually discuss what color the dragons are. He doesn't, I don't think he cares what color I paint the cats. I don't think he's ever said anything about the cats, but some of the other things he's, he, he wants particular colors. <coughs> and this one is again, you can tell Julie probably lives through some of this experience where the cat just gets transfixed by the shinies on the tree. This is more of a scaly cat dragon than the other one, but very big fluffy tail. That's a very long tail. Because it it start like it goes around the whole cat. It's it's an awesome long fluffy tail. And there's the expression. I think Julie was very clever in how she has the ornament and you know it's attached to a tree, even though that's not in the scene. Or it was attached until the cat grabbed it. Annoying because I took my medicine. And that's why I don't work with dry pastel. And there's the top view because the this is one of those miniatures that can be a little harder to see the three dimensionality of it in pictures. This is Tinker the Gnome. There's not an article on him because this is before I was doing articles. I wish there was, because I, I mean, I think I know what colors I used. I think it was like Volcano Brown and whatever the darker one of that used to be. Looks like there's some purple in there too. And then if you spend the $40, you also get, now you only get, why is it not doing the thing? <coughs> you only get one of these per order. So the other ones for every $40 you spend, you get to pick out a miniature. This one is just for every order that's over $40. You get the Christmas sampler while supplies last. And it's this uh, St. Nicholas the Mighty figure that Jason Weavey paint, er, sculpted and Michael Proctor painted. So he's pretty cool. And you also get coal black, which has been a very popular color from the holidays in the past. It's kind of a really dark turquoise. <coughs> and Rudolph red, which I have no idea what it looks like because I think that's a brand new color. And I haven't seen it before. So I will have to place an order as well so that I can find out what that looks like. Although honestly, if there was a color I was gonna say that we had enough of, it would be red. Maybe I just don't see the distinctions between reds as well as some other colors. <coughs> oh, I apologize, I have no idea why this is happening so much. I try to prepare and I took all of the medicine I thought would fix it because it has been a little I like the paint I don't think my throat loves the indoor heating all right so I finished that one and I guess technically that one's the next one So if you have questions about any of the Christmas miniatures that I painted, I can try and answer, but some of them were some of them were a hot minute ago, so I may or may not remember much about painting them. Because I'm old. Actually that's not even I just have a terrible memory. I always have. In some ways, I think it's gotten a little worse. But in other ways, it's gotten better. Like I used to, as a kid, I would just forget hats and umbrellas and scarves and all that kind of thing. Enough to drive my mother crazy. And I've 
I'm better at that now because it's like I have a system. It's like, okay, the, the thing should be here and I can check. I know I need to check if I have the thing. But stuff where I can't have a system where it's just like facts or whatever. I may or may not remember. It's very random. What I remember or not. Just adding a little more shading. I think I need to add a little more shading on this side as well. Try to make those darker so that the suckers showed up more. Where I goof, I'm not really trying to get it completely off. I'm just trying to blend it in enough that it's not. It's not a problem. I mean, there's a lot of color weirdness here, so. A little more color weirdness isn't going to be a problem. All of the colors are kind of in the see, family. Well, families, I guess, because I had some of the greens and some of the purples and pinks and whatnot. I didn't take that shadow up high. Fixing that. And a little more down the side, I'm guessing. Mm, right even up here. This kind of curves so it's straight, and plus there's a big brain overhanging it, so it is not getting a ton of light right there. get lighter and there is some awkward to reach stuff happening here so I apologize for the twisty turny Maybe that was a little too much shadow there. Now that I have it held in the correct orientation. So that's important to do. We make that mistake a lot where you either pull back on things, like you're like, oh, that's, this is way too, you know, contrasted or dark or light or whatever, because I'm holding it like this. So that, that section isn't gonna look right anymore because I painted it to look right from this orientation. So you have to check your viewing angle pretty regularly and because that's the important thing it doesn't matter if it looks monkey from this angle it matters if it looks correct from the angles that people will look at it so when I said you know contest judges pick things up and look at other sections we don't expect we it's supposed to look right from here we're just sometimes checking that you know you painted the bottom of the tentacle or whatever it doesn't have to look right from you know every angle a well-painted miniature often does not look right from every angle because you kind of have to pick where your light is and what it's doing and that may or may not look amazing from every angle depending on what you're painting this is one reason some people prefer um, true metallics because they will tend to look more correct from more angles like non-metallic metal you kind of have to pick a few viewing angles and just accept that it's not going to look amazing if somebody does that
but because there's some natural reflections on true metallics, um, they will look more correct from more angles because they'll be actually catching the light and whatnot. That we real reflections. I mean, it's still good if you kind of pick a direction and you paint your shadows with matte paint, I think, doing the, people call it different things, demi-metallics or shaded metallics. I think that helps because if you use matte paint, um, then you don't see a lot of reflection in the shadow areas, which is what you want. Like, you don't want to get a stray reflection in your shadow areas. So using matte paint helps prevent that while well, you still get the nice reflections from various angles where the, um, you know, the mid-tones and highlights with your metallic paints are. Sorry, I'm out of practice, so. I mean, not that I think I was ever amazing at talking about painting and painting at the same time. I mean, it's a, that's a whole skill in itself. I am not one of these adept multitasky type people. I'm lucky if I can do one thing well at a time. So partly I'm moving it around a lot to reach it, and partly I'm moving it around to try to view it from the angle that the viewer would see it. And my paints are definitely thickening up a little, but in a way that I can fix more easily on like the wet palette last week. Although I think we're close to the end. Well, we're not so close that I won't add a little bit of water to, and it's these ones that have a lot of white in it that are really, that it's most noticeable that I'm getting like super stark strokes with. You guys have been very quiet. We only had, we only had a couple of answers to the how long have you been painting question. I don't know if any of our other raiders are still here, but if you are, I am 100% okay with lurkers. I am usually a lurker on things. I, mean, I try to participate in the Reaper streams, but in general, I'm usually more of a lurker. But I also, um, I tend to do like a variety pack of topics, I guess. I don't, this is, I'm, I've been painting this miniature for the past two, two and a quarter episodes, I guess. But that is not usually what I do. Like um, I was talking about paint, you know, talking about how I paint red and doing some examples and stuff. Um, and that's more typically what I do is jump around a little bit. Hi, uh, Liz Tiffany. I think that's Tiz. I'm, I can't quite see the text in the chat well enough. And Raiders, welcome to the stream. Um, I'm close to finishing up today, but even once I finish, uh, our stream moderator will find us something else fun to watch. I'm painting the Hive Warden today. I'll hold it further back so you can see him a little more. Thanks, Liz Tiffany. I actually, I looked up pictures of a real brain. Um, I do think it's good to look at references of things. I didn't for the tentacles, I'm just making that up. Um, but sometimes things look differently than we think they do in our minds. Uh, and I wanted to paint a nice gross looking brain. So I looked that up with safe search off even. So I was, I was rolling the dice on that one. All right, I got just drawn on this tentacle. Hardest part of painting this guy is remembering which tentacle I'm working on. It was easier working on the brain because I didn't, it was just the brain. Think about which side of the brain, that was about it. And I am using some pretty wacky colors. Um, there's a lot of pinks and purples in with my greens. I'll show my palette briefly. 
mixing things together. I'm not really using these very much. And I haven't had to go up to that as much as I expected. But these are getting some a pretty good workout. Excuse me just a second. Yeah, the, the picture I had, uh, I guess it was a freshly dissected brain? I don't know. It had a little bit of blood on it, and then I grabbed some gloss sealer and added that on the parts where the blood was so that it looked nice and wet and fresh and whatnot. Do I have the gloss sealer? Yes. So I use this gloss sealer. Um, I like working with matte paints a lot. That's one of the things I really like about Reaper paints. Um... So I would prefer to do, instead of looking for a shiny paint, I'm more likely to want to use uh, my matte paints and then use something like the sealer to make them less matte later. But I know that there are plenty of painters who like having paints with a mix of finishes. So if they're painting something like um, leather, say, you know, not super old leather, but leather that still has some sheen to it, They'll use a paint that's like satin. Uh, so you're getting the effect both from their painting in lighter places where the light reflects, but also the um, paint is reflecting light a little bit. And I think that's cool, but uh, my brain just works better if all my paint is the same finish and I either paint in the effect or I use materials later to put that effect in. That is just me. So I'm trying to make the tentacles kind of gross to go with the brain. So I'm trying to use somewhat disquieting combinations of green and pink. Just trying to hold it away a bit to see. Well, sometimes it works to look at the screen to get the what it looks like from further away. But it's hard on stream to, uh, you know, pause and hold things out at arm's length or away from your light, which is a really good thing to do when you're painting. It's very helpful um, to seeing where you might need to add more contrast or something else. Oh, I'm back on the wrong tentacle. But uh, it's super hard to do on stream because everything's set up so that. You, know, you can see in this area, but not otherwise. Mm, let's see, a little more texture here and there. There, I wanted to go later, but I actually matched the value, so I'm just going to come back and do it again. Picking the right value can be challenging. Reaching around all this guy's tentacles can be challenging too. Ah. See, there's nowhere for my hand to get to the side here. Maybe if I come at this direction. But then I can't see where I want to see. But anyway, I'm going to call that tentacle done. Um, now, oh no, I didn't do the top of that one. I'm not going to call that tentacle done. I did the shading, but I didn't do the highlighting and texturing. Or I guess that side of the tentacles. And then I will probably call it a day and let Quindy find us something fun to do. Quindy's got the hookup. She knows where all the fun stuff is happening. challenge with the upper part of the tentacles is adding texture and interest but still keeping it darker because that was kind of the, the vibe that I had going and I would like to keep the vibe. Just a little bit to those. Um, I do not know what those lumps are meant to be. I mean what you would call that. I know what it's meant to be but what you would call that effect on skin. 
So I'm just going to call them lumps. This side is uh, suckers, but the other side is just like pebbly textured skin, I think. Those suckers look a little too bright, don't they? It's wet, technically. I probably should stop messing with them, but we're just gonna call it wet blending. And it's all good. I think I just need to lighten them up a little, and then that other color should work. Because it is maybe too wet. And I will just leave it. Leave the ones that are drying alone for a minute. spots all right I think so that's the finished side I mean I probably need to do a glaze or work in some of this texture make it look a little more natural I don't know we'll see I think it might be good enough um, there's a few spots where it seems a little I don't want it to look painted on is the thing I want it to look like it's kind of either part of the skin or, you know, just under the skin, but that it's natural. It's natural color variation. Not paint. Um, so that's the side that's almost done. I don't think I've worked on this tentacle at all. I started here and started working around the side. And that's kind of where I started today. If you look at those ones. The example of where I started today. So this isn't finished and these aren't finished. And then if you want to see how I got to this stage if you watch last week's episode which I think should still be on Twitch but also Reaper archives all of their Twitch streams onto their YouTube channel which Quindy is going to be very kind and and drop a link in and then if you go there and you go to playlists there's a playlist for every show so the show is Beyond the Kit so you look at the Beyond the Kit playlist and if you scroll down on the bottom last week's show it should be the one at the bottom I saw it saw it pop up on my YouTube so I'm pretty confident that Quindy put it there. Uh, Quindy is our amazing moderator. We could not get by without her because I don't even, I didn't remember this guy was called the Eye Warden. I'm just calling him Brain Monster and she went and looked him up for us. Um, but that's, that's where I got today. I don't know if I'll paint the rest of him on stream. I do kind of want to finish him now that he's, look, he's so close. And I got to figure out what to do with all this nonsense. Um, but I try to mix it up a little on my streams, so we'll see. We'll see if I finish it up. If I do, it probably won't be for a little while, because uh, I'm gonna, gonna switch and talk about painting red or painting green or do something else that's a little festive maybe next week. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, it's nice to get to hang out with you again. I had to miss a couple of weeks, and I'm glad to be back. Uh, if, if you weren't here earlier, go to reapermini.com and you can see all the cool holiday stuff that Reaper's got going. I think, I think the 12 days has probably been turned on since we, since I started the stream because they're two or three hours earlier than I am. So they should be past noon now. And, um, I'm going to let Quindy find us a raid and I will sign off. Yes. Quindy confirms that the 12 days promotion is on. And then if you go with the banner at the top, uh, it'll say stocking stuffers and you can see a different selection of holiday miniatures, those ones you buy instead of it being gift with purchase. And then there's also something called the Holiday Sampler, which uh, will have its own banner, but you'll also see it on the 12 days. Um, if you click through the 12 days, it'll show you that. 
Uh, or if you just want to watch the restream as soon as this stops, I show pictures from some of the miniatures and explain the promotion. But I see that the raid is up, so I'm going to let you go, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.